The window stands broken in its frame. Cold wind blows in. The morning light hurts your eyes. It's hazy, but you see the ocean and some war-torn buildings. The shards face outward. Whatever broke this window came from the inside. A fine web of scarring covers the back of your right hand, but none of it is recent. More likely a projectile than a held object. There are no fragments on the floor from pulling a tool back in after impact. Something you've done before. It is too large for a bullet, yet too small for a piece of furniture. You're looking for something heavy and larger than your fist. Like the green shoe that's on the hat rack in the corner, which, coincidentally, is missing its friend. Congratulations, you smashed the window with your own shoe. Now you only have one. If you're lucky, you can still find the other on the balcony outside. The door to it should be outside your room. You mean someone else took your shoe off and smashed the window with it? This person also forced the drinks on you. The cool wind gushes in. Your toes curl up from the cold. Maybe more than twelve. No, eight pairs of boots have shuffled back and forth in the mud. One, standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 46. Two, standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 44. Three, hobnailed work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 43. 4. Standard work boot, number 45 or 46. You don't know. It's a miracle you can tell the prints apart as it is. The cold must have preserved them. 5. Another standard work boot, steel reinforced toes, number 44. 6. An aberration, light as air. Even pace, same make of boot, but number 41. Impossible to tell. Could also have been an adolescent. The gait is undeveloped. You're not bad. It's as if the whole world darkens. Everything else has a thin film of unimportance on it, and the tracks burn in the middle of it in a strange, beautiful way. 7. The glowing outline of a standard work boot, number 46, but the imprints are twice as deep as the others. The weight exceeds 200 kilograms. 8. And yet another standard work boot, number 44. There's an aberration in the pattern of the sole, however. The right sole is smoother, more worn. This is a trick. You've done it before. Pink is where the blood settled in the first hours post-mortem. You can use it to see if the corpse has been tampered with. Does his position at the time of death match the discoloration? Only the lower extremities are pink with a dash of blue. His fatted hands, thighs and his neck, just above the noose. The rest of the corpse appears dark green in the cold spring air. You would still like the hypostasis marks in the neck to be a bit more pronounced. For seven days, the cadaver is quite well preserved. Surprisingly so. There's no deflation, no apparent fly larvae in the abdomen. How convenient that they're stranded like beached whales at that roundabout. Hmm, roughly 50. Dry 40. The damage is so extensive, it's better to err on the young side. He nods. Would it be a good idea to cut the knot instead of the belt? Seems the more conservative approach. From wounds sustained over two, maybe more decades, dispersal and accumulation indicates long and active combat duty. Last item, 
hands. Hmm. 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 I'm sure we didn't get everything. There's always something. An abrasion collar. This is what we're after. I see it. Yeah, cocking boot. You know that jolly union cow fucker? Came around talking about cows or some shit? Came around pretending like he cares about cows? Yes, you met him at the gates. The one with the boots and the jolly smile. Don't forget his face. The bloated and reddened cheeks. The bulbous nose. This would be Kuno after 30 years of alcohol and substance abuse. An aerostatic passes overhead. The whiskers of its floodlights on the ground below. Kitsuragi's glasses light up as he looks to the sky. Two glowing circles. Moreover, the boots were size 37. Tiny. There are too many discrepancies in all this. Easy. He's the skinny man who thinks he's a poet. Never trust a poet. Also, he's the only one I can see from here. That's correct. There is no visibility of any of the others. You see traces of mayonnaise and ketchup on it, as well as a tomato wedge. The wrapper reads, Shish Kebab Revachon. It's no older than a day or two. No mold yet. His expression is dull, like the sea behind him. Drops of water shining on his moustache. His eyes, empty and wide, look frightening in their frozen gaze. Height, 170 to 175 centimeters. Curly hair, stout build, age approximately 50 to 60 years. He could have easily disappeared into the sea through that hole, and you would have never found him. The lieutenant has taken off his foggy glasses and is busy cleaning them in his handkerchief. For now, you're on your own here. Condensation from stepping inside. You should return to the boardwalk now that the body has been taken away. There's something you need to see. A little something that your visual cortex has put together while you were away. There are no collars on the barbell. This is a safety hazard. The bear looks oddly realistic. Is it taxidermy? The lieutenant doesn't answer. His eyes are glued to the animal. A sharp slice of light shines out from its mysterious belly door. She's got a direct view to the backyard. You should interrogate her about the lynching. I might have, but in this case, all I would have seen is my own reflection staring back from the darkness. It's light here, but dark in the yard at night. Just for the record, you look nothing like the man on the document. Ruination has come. The broken arches betray the once grand history of this building. It towered over the harbor until it happened. A great force from the northeast fired into the city. Heavy artillery shelled the coastline, fired from the water, a straight shot into Revachol. The tenement acted as a defensive wall against the worst of the shelling until it was destroyed and they had a direct firing line. The waves of the Martinez Inlet roll over the fallen remains of the building. The dark waters obscure the better part of the remains. Those arches acted as support for something greater than what you see now. Only three stories stand where nine to twelve once did. Restoration has failed. What the shelling took out was never rebuilt. A fleet, the combined armies of Occident and Grad, with Mesk volunteers, a five-nation army, hundreds of vessels, they massed airships further down in the Bay of Revachol. The artillery was so powerful. The ships not only required gyroscopic stabilization, they were anchored into the ocean floor as well. Many are still there to this day. 
If you squint, you can just barely see the shadow on the water, far in the northeast. Cannons still ready to placate Rivershaw. Don't let him go. This could be your witness. The balcony has a great view of the whole thing. Do a head count first. Connect these men to the tracks you saw in the yard. Chances are they're going to match. In conclusion, these seven are the actors on the crime scene. The footprints were theirs, but there's a discrepancy. Exactly, the missing lady driver who was running the drug trade. Does it mean the Hardy Boys are involved in the drug trade as well? Maybe, but hey, you've stood there for about four seconds not saying anything. Now is a good time to hit them with questions. Where's the eighth Hardy? The fuck is with you, fella? It's inornate, nearly illegible, yet marching in orderly lines. Pedagogical, somehow. Brash. It must be yours for you to be able to read it. These are the lines of someone who has written by hand a lot and has developed a style only they themselves, or you yourself, can decipher. No, you don't. You're a human measuring instrument, almost entirely intellectual. A young woman in her twenties. There is care, effort, and a smile, you think. Although that is not something you can read from someone's handwriting. It doesn't really matter. And I do apologize for the surveillance. Wild Pines can't afford to be blind at a time like this. One of the tall buildings overlooking the roundabout, most likely. That would give them a read on the entire quarter. It's not just this week. What do you want? There's something about this guy that matches with a face in your head. A similar, but different face. Yes, the pulsing base. A sure sign of junior delinquency, somewhere east of here. There's something on the sea ice there. The next is the longest. It runs all the way around the border, and then some. You count 216 perforations. Considering that nice, large number, a wave of pride washes over you. Though you can't say why, precisely. It looks like you had quite the charming face way back then. Your hair is brown and slightly curly. Your eyes seem more clear somehow. The lack of alcohol swelling is a bonus, though there's a pinch of that in your cheeks already. No, they work good sediments. And some at the sensor, it seems. All that during the last nine years. A suit of armor like this would have been manufactured with a particular person's physique in mind. You should ask for whom this suit was fitted. Fucking loin clots. Really did him in. What it means. In what must have been Seminine. Nah, you've earned it. All right now. Free commerce! Keep the goods flowing! On the photo in your hands, the dead man's skin is studded with stars. Tens, hundreds of them, littering his dead skin. A cold sea breeze stings your face as you step on the boardwalk. The body is gone, but something still lingers in the air and high above it, against the stars. A luminous wheel of pleasure and all things bright, its wooden frame creaking in the wind. Twelve red cabins form a circle that stretches from the engine below to the flocks of seagulls up in the sky. The little wooden gondolas dangle in the wind, their seats empty and floors littered with old ice cream papers and discarded tickets. The pleasure wheel stands still on the boardwalk, its twelve red cabins suspended in the air. There's a ticket office made out of an old gondola, its wooden frame the same shade of red as the ones above, a sign mounted on its side declares 20 centims for the ride of a lifetime. 
The pleasure wheels stand still on the boardwalk, its twelve red cabins suspended in the air. The pleasure wheels stand still on the boardwalk, its twelve red cabins suspended in the air. Some waves come crashing against the boardwalk, shattering the mirage. The tire tracks were left here by an unknown event that took place some days ago. It's a message written in the language of burnt rubber. Some of that rubber stuck to the tiles right in front of the whirling in rags. This is point A. The driver started there and then accelerated straight into the fence. The driver proceeded to back out of the yard, barely stopping before hitting the adjacent building. Before heading south, must have been in a hurry. You are correct. This is a rather motor carriage friendly city. Somehow that makes you feel scared. You don't know why. I'm not sure. There are plenty of traffic accidents waiting to happen in Martinez. With the jam right here on the roundabout, I would keep them separate. You could follow the track south. There seems to be a canal there. See where they went, if you find the time. Judging by the size of the impact and the parallel lines of burnt rubber, the cause was probably a motor vehicle. These look like the same tire tracks I saw earlier, in front of the whirling rags. Side slip marks indicated that the vehicle was traveling up the crater at 35 kilometers an hour. The black marks on the roof indicate that the vehicle vaulted from the crater to the roof of the shack. The panel served as a takeoff ramp. The vehicle soared through the air, hitting the billboard and upsetting the posts. Then it continued its flight, taking the billboard with it. The sign broke the vehicle's fall into the canal. The Samarin Butter billboard still looks freshly painted, suggesting it took the plunge recently. Within the past 72 hours, Still speeding, the vehicle made a loop and vanished into the fog along the coast. There are two good candidates, the Cuprise 40 and the Linear G22. It's about the right size, and the tire marks look like they came from the skinny tires frequently found on that motor carriage. The Cuprise 40 is a very popular model with bank clerks, topping pie delivery drivers, secondary school teachers, cops, strippers dressed as cops, undressed strippers. Very sturdy but light motor carriage. More likely than most to survive that jump. The Linear G22 is not a particularly popular model due to its peculiar proportions, which the manufacturer's design team probably thought about for too long. You'd have to follow the tracks to be sure. The lieutenant looks on, waiting for you to wrap up your analysis. Remember the tire tracks in Martinez? This is where they were leading. It appears to be so. The ice hasn't closed around the vehicle yet. My guess is it's been here since last Saturday or Sunday. The estimate is correct. The incident probably occurred on Sunday evening. Your mocking tone finds no response but the motion of the waves. Yes, yes. Crazy recklessness. I'd say it has been here since last Saturday or Sunday. Hmm, correct. The density of the bullet holes is unusual. Even in a general, average bullet hole frequency in Martinez sense. Grim affairs. Meaning, this is a lot of bullet holes. Looks like fully automatic rifle fire. Something you don't see these days. The manufacturing and sale of automatic rifles was curtailed after the revolution. The destructive power of such tools proved to be too much. We do need to retain some humanity in this world. A row of ghostly shades stand facing the wall. There are many of them, a dozen at least. The heads lowered and eyes blindfolded. It's quiet. 
No sound. No movement. Ten meters away, other shades are lined up in an orderly manner. Automatic rifles prime. A gust of wind blows by. The coats of the firing squad flap slowly in the breeze. A single person stands on the side. Droplets of rain fall on the wooden planks, the surrounding sand dunes. The clouds block out any rays of light. A long time has passed since the moment of this fusillading. Rain and brine have since washed all the blood away. Not a trace remains. The abundance of bullet holes leads to two options. Either an inordinate amount of executions were performed here, or they did not use a conscience round, where only one soldier has the loaded rifle. Looks like this was a mass execution with everyone fully armed. A host of men, probably in everyday clothes, ragged from the conflict and covered in dust. They were not sitting, a common practice for executions in some nations, as demonstrated by the height level of the bullet holes. They stand, facing the wall. It's impossible to discern any details about their personality or background. Seven men in combat uniforms and dark coats, holding automatic rifles aimed at the people. Soldiers from some side, but from which one? Men of duty, dark duty. Murderers, twisted by orders, young boys forced into killing. The Commandant, the one who gives the order. Machine gun fire crackling through the air. The lights of the muzzle flashes dancing on his face. I don't know. I don't know who died here, lined up beside that horrible wall. It could have been any of the parties involved in the revolution. Perhaps the ones executed here were the loyalist conservatives killed by the communists at the start of the civil war. Or it could have been the communists put to death during the last stretch of the conflict by the coalition forces. It could even have been the employees of the failed R&D center down the coast as their building was taken over by the revolutionaries. Or maybe... Yeah, it's very unlikely the coalition forces were the ones who died here. They were always the last ones against the wall. To be honest, if a coalition member was anyone in this situation, it was a commandant, the superior giving the orders. A cold sea wind blows away the figures. This window is pristine, at least on the inside. A red thread has been taped to the glass using adhesive tape. It trembles ever so slightly in the cold wind. This is ballistics. She's left a trajectory for us. Golden light melts away into the blue, glassy darkness of your mind. In it are two neon-lit shapes, a man and a woman on the single bed. A two-hearted spider. Like the witness said, the man is kneeling, the woman is on her back. It's the night of March 4th and a shot has just been fired. The man looks directly at the woman. The shot's possible directions converge in his mouth, a ray cast from somewhere outside, entering his brain. Ending him. The red thread bisecting the room shows the trajectory of the bullet. From the roof outside, Location A prime. The glass fractures around the bullet hole. Shards face inwards like a corona behind the woman's back. Maybe if you extrapolate all possible points of origin first, the thread will make sense. The man does not know the bullet has entered his brain. He never will. Death comes faster than the realization. Ruby ruled this out vehemently. The shot would have been heard from downstairs, where no one heard it. The likelihood of A-prime has fallen drastically. You may be looking for a sniper. The shot had to come from a greater distance, beyond A-prime. Should we extrapolate to include every possible point of origin in Martinez? According to your map of the district, this shot could have come from a wide angle of locations, starting with the northern edge of the abandoned boardwalk ending with an islet in the bay. Let's call them B-prime. B-prime for boardwalk, 
B double prime for Land's End and B triple prime for the Islet detective. There may be smaller points in between, but those are too fine to zoom in on. 700 meters away, the likeliest of these B positions, 20% chance. A skilled sniper could have made the shot, provided he had a safe sniper's nest. Even with the light on inside, we're talking military training. At that distance, the perpetrator would have had to take wind direction into account. This would explain why no one heard the gunshot. The bullet came from far away. 1.2 kilometers away, the least likely of these positions. Let's say 3%. A truly skilled sniper could have done it, possibly from a tent. No, too far-fetched. One kilometer away, an unlikely point of origin. Beyond the docks somewhere, on an islet in the Bay of Martinez, perhaps. There are islets there, badly charted as they may be. The shot would have been a small miracle, 5% likelihood. There is an extremely narrow field of view from the bay to the window, between Rue de saint Gislain 8B and 33A. The angle would have been extreme and access to the islets is questionable, but it is a possibility. Then there's the thread the witness left. She did have a first-hand view of the event. Perhaps she found something in the outer reaches of her memory of it. You need to inspect it again. It suggests the bullet came from the extreme upper quadrant of possible angles, from a point beyond the roof. B triple prime. The island in the bay. Unless she thinks the perpetrator was standing on the ring antenna. That is where the thread seems to point. There's a rain-soaked mattress on a concrete slab, only half covered by the crumbling roof. At the head of it, double embrasures, firing slits like two eyes in the wall. This looks like a good place to aim from. A single-person mattress, modern, civilian use. Brand name, Marjorie. There's a fuel stain on the cover, along with cigarette burns and an empty can of beans on the ground next to it, filled to the brim with cigarette butts. The silhouette of a tobacco picker adorns the paper filter, the brand Tio Moteri. Contemporary River Sholians prefer Juan, a local blend from the Southern Islands, or Astra, the legendary cigarette from Grad. Tio Moteri is favored by older men for its paper filter tips, sweet smell, and added tar. The smoker is a clean person. I didn't see any signs of smoking inside. Keeps it tidy. Prefers to come out here to smoke. There's a firing slit in the wall in front of you, like a little window. Quite old and grimy from years without cleaning by anything other than the rain. The springs screech as you lean on the mattress and crane your neck to look out. Trepidation, a tingling feeling in your stomach. A small piece of Martinez coastline opens up in the square in front of you, like a tiny landscape painting. One kilometer across the water, the ruins look familiar. A towering skyscraper, its top floors shaved off by artillery fire, capeside apartments, Rue de saint Gislain. 33A and 33B. The red chimney and collapsed back of the four-story tenement in front of the whirling in rags, Rue de saint Gislain, 10, the doomed commercial area. The box-shaped silhouette of the whirling in rags, its sloped roof, a tiny fleck of light catches your eye on the rooftop, sunlight reflecting off the upstairs window of Clasia's room. What does that mean? Do you have line of sight to the window? More than that. Whenever you want it, like your own little dollhouse. A pair of binoculars or a scope of a rifle? You'd be prone, lying on the mattress, barrel resting on the embrasure. Cheek against the cheek rest, hand on the hair trigger, on a calm day like this.
good. I think we have it, detective. The origin of the shot. This is the sniper's nest. Affirmative. In our defense, nothing pointed here. Many, many leads pointed elsewhere. Don't beat yourself up, officer. We did not put guns in their hands or get them drunk. The lieutenant pauses. Regret comes over him. We will make up for it. Here. I feel it. Where? He does not answer. Just nods. With his back hunched, he looks around once more and says, he feels uncomfortable suddenly. We should move now. 